All right, I want to do another tutorial for you guys. First Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. This is amazing. Same, same situation we have here, guys. First Timothy 3, 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God, this is the word that's in question. This is the word this is the this is the word that the Unitarians and the Arianists are trying to promote as being a loose, a very gray, a word here that could be redefined differently. It's very subjective. It's not objective. All right. This is the this is the word in question. Now I'm going to show you guys unequivocally without a shadow of a doubt. There's no there's no doubts in what the definition of the word here. The writers of the New Testament use this particular writing of the word God, the Greek word theos, the specific spelling and inflection of the word theos a specific way. And I'm going to show it to you, but let's read the verse first and then let's go into the evidence. Without controversy, there's no arguing this. Great is the mystery of godliness. It is mysterious, godliness, how we are to be like God, how we are similar, but how we're different. This is very mysterious. How is, how is the Messiah the same and different? I think John 1, 1, 1, 1 answers that. John 1, 1. However, it says, even though it's a mystery, it's still without controversy. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. The argument here is that this is talking about the son who is less than God, who is below God, who is, who is lesser than God. He's not equal with God. He's below him. He was created by him. That's the Unitarian argument. Versus the true biblical, scriptural, sound, oneness theology says this is God and the Son. This is the one and only true God who became the Son. So the identity of the one who became the Son doesn't change. And at the end of the day, I got to accept it. That's what the scripture says. You don't believe? This is where we go a little deeper. When people start telling you, oh, the definition here changes, let's check into that. Click on the, click on the scripture, 1 Timothy 3.16, and above you see the Greek, Texas Receptus. And let's look for the word God, it's theos, and here it is right here. You click on it, it shows up on the right side. The particular way that it's inflected and the way that it's spelled, you click on this, And lo and behold, this particular inflection of the word theos is only used 10 times. This is probably the easiest. This is easier. This is easier. Less passages to go through than John 1.1. 1, 1. Okay? John 1.1 1, 1 has 239 times the word is used. So you got a lot more scriptures to go through. This one, you only got 10. We can actually probably read all of them today. Let's go through them. So, and the question we're asking is the definition that's being used with this word, is it the supreme divine person, supreme divine person, supreme divinity, or is it just a, a deity, a spiritual being? That's what's in question. Is it a celestial being that's below the supreme being, or is it the supreme being every single time this word is being used? That's what's in question. Matthew 22, 32. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. We have a lot of gods here. So let's open this up on the side. Click on it. Boom, 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 boom. Here it is right here. It's the last one. All right. The inflection we're looking at is this guy, capital T-H which is right here, capital T-H-E, apostrophe going to the left above the O. 
And absolutely, that's what we got. Boom, it's the last one. Okay? Are we going to now say that I am the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob? God is not the, and then change that second God? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living? So now God should be lowercase here. God is not the small G-O-D of the dead. Or are we going to keep this the same, keep it consistent? As if this is a bad thing, God of the dead. No, it's talking about I am not the supreme divine person of the dead. I am the supreme divine person of the living. It's not a negative. If this is a negative, then I guess we can put that in First uh, Timothy chapter 3.16 as a negative. No, that doesn't make any sense. It's all consistent here. I am the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. God is not the God. It's all consistent. We're talking about the same God here. We're talking about the same position, the supreme position. I am the supreme divine person of Abraham. I am the supreme divine person of Isaac. I am the supreme divine person of Jacob. The supreme divine person is not the supreme divine person of the dead, but of the living, period. Very consistent. Mark chapter 12, verse 27. He is not the supreme divine person of the dead, but the supreme divine person of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken, okay? There's confirmation, same, same, same verse, same message. Mark chapter 12, verse 32. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one supreme divine person, and there is no other but he. Hallelujah. Praise be unto the Most High, Yah. who became a man to become our Yahusha, Yah, our Savior. All right? John chapter 3, verse 34. For he whom the supreme divine person has sent speaks the words of the supreme di divine person. For the supreme divine person does not give the spirit by measure. I don't think there's any question here. There shouldn't be any questions here of how the word God is being used. Acts chapter 4, verse 24. So when they heard that they raised their when they heard that, they raised their voice to the supreme divine person with one accord and said, I believe that's Yahuwah there. Yahuwah, you are the supreme divine person who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 7, verse 32, saying, I am the supreme divine person of your fathers and the supreme divine person of Abraham the supreme divine person of Isaac and the supreme divine person of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Hallelujah. Romans 14, verse 4. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for the supreme divine person is able to make him stand. Hallelujah. And then lo and behold, 1 Timothy chapter 3, 16. Are we going to just change the definition now of God here? because it's inconvenient to our theology and our understanding of God, because I can't, under, I don't get, I don't understand. I don't, I can't comprehend how Yahushua is the father, but he's not the father at the same time. And he's speaking to himself and probably, and you, we complicate this whole, this whole aspect of God when he lives outside of our world. Like he's not even, he's not even originally from our world. He created our world. He's outside the box. And we're trying to put him inside of a box just because we can't fit him in our box right now. And we don't understand this doesn't give us the right or the jurisdiction to start changing definition of words when scripture specifically uses a word a specific way consistently in scripture. And that is my point I'm trying to bring to y'all today. First Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. The supreme divine person was made manifest in the flesh justified in his own spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. Yes, he received himself back to himself. Revelation 21, verse 4, and the supreme divine person will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things that have passed away. Brothers and sisters, I don't think there's any doubt here. There shouldn't be. 
go over these 10 verses and ask yourself, should the word God in 1 Timothy 3.16 be changed? Or should it remain consistent? Shalom.